here. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen. <clears throat> While I'm sharing my screen, um, I hope that you can bear with me. I'm beginning to lose my voice. <clears throat> so if I sound a bit different, uh, that's probably why. Um, <clears throat> or I may pause occasionally to take a sip of water. Um, but yeah, welcome to Tribal Council or Tribal Cultural Resource and Mitigations. Um, happy to have you here. Um, <clears throat> and for those of you who are continuing on in the series, welcome back and thanks for tuning in and staying apart. And those of you who are new, hi, um, glad you could join us. Um, as you know, I'll start off with introductions. Um, my name is Ethan, my family name is Lawton, and my native name is Kwakbuk, but Red Eagle is a lot easier to say. Um, and I'm originally from Anchorage, Alaska. I come from four tribes. Um, I'm a quarter Inupik, and we're part of the Inuit umbrella, and we're located in the northwestern part of Alaska. <clears throat> my family's village is Kotzebue. I'm also a quarter Sioux, uh, specifically Lakota, and we're located in North and South um, Dakotas and part of the Seven Council Fires. I'm also a quarter Navajo, uh, specifically the Bitter Water Clan, and we're located in the Four Corners, and uh, we call ourselves the Dene. Uh, Navajo is, um, I believe, an Apache given name means like a sheep herder or something like that, um, sheep stealer. But um, Dene is our own given name in our own language and it means the people. I'm also um, a quarter Thona Atam. We're located in Southern Arizona and my family's village is Gatka and we're formerly known as Papago. Again, the Apache given name, um, Papago meant cotton pickers. And we renamed ourselves um, Thonatham, meaning people of the desert or desert dwellers. Um, so that's a bit about uh, my background. I may look young, but it's the native genes in me. And uh, I've been a cultural specialist for about 14 years now, um, working with numerous different cultures and understanding the backgrounds and differences and how they come together and where they don't come together. Um, and then that launched me into tribal liaison. And I've been doing that for about nine years now and um, been relatively new to the planning world. Um, only been a planner for about five years now. Um, still a lot to learn in the planning realm, but um, I kind of bring that cross-cultural component and the tribal components to the planning world throughout each of these different positions. And over the years, um, I've worked with professionally with over 100, over 50 tribes. Um, personally got to travel to over 100 reservations throughout the US and have interacted with people from over 150 tribes. So quite a diverse background. And this is um, kind of where I'm coming from in the things that we'll be covering. So as Bob mentioned, it's part of a, a tribal part series. Um, and I totally messed up on the number. Don't look at that. Um, but we started off with tribal cross-cultural etiquette and ethics, like meeting with tribes. And uh, we even did that one twice. And you may have seen it maybe at the AEP Institute or the state conference. Um, and then we went into tribal sovereignty and tribal governance. Um, and tribal consultation. Uh, many of you may have tuned in for Friday's um, kind of caveat from tribal consultation, specifically around the protocol and policy. Um, then we covered tribal lands, um, big topic. And, and then that's how we are where we're at today with tribal uh, cultural resources and mitigations. So I floated this way because it kind of builds on itself. 
and there is a lot of overlap. Um, and so as you kind of learned throughout the process, uh, it allows us to get deeper and deeper and deeper. And that leads to the next one, number six, not number five, but tribal confidentiality. So that's one you can expect in the near future. Um, now that you know all this and you're applying it, uh, being aware of the con confidential components of it, um, not only in the meetings, but in the publications and correspondence and different things like that. So um, stay tuned for when that will take place. I think it'll take place in the spring um, of next year. But we'll keep you in the loop. As you know, I have a few disclaimers. Uh, when I say me or the tribe or tribes, um, know that I'm not technically officially speaking on behalf of all the tribes. This is just general information. And um, I highly encourage you to correspond with the tribe you're working with and to get more um, detailed information. This is just a, a starting platform to give you direction and guidance as you are working with tribes. And <clears throat> although we're talking about a lot of legal components, this is not intended to be legal advice. I highly encourage you to talk to your own legal counsel if you don't have legal counsel. Um, California Indian Legal Services is somebody I would recommend. They will help out, especially within when, when it comes to tribes. So the purpose of the presentation is for cultural resources and mitigations. And it's to provide a better understanding for uh, maybe you work with tribes and maybe this is new to you or maybe you know nothing about all this or maybe you do know stuff and you're just brushing up on it. Um, but it's for the purpose of you know, developing and improving mitigation measures and the importance of collaborating with tribal representatives. And we'll cover cultural resources, tribal cultural resources, very little on trust assets, um, but a lot of it is applicable all over. And we'll cover standard mitigation measures, which many of you might be familiar with. And then we'll cover creative mitigation measures, um, kind of thinking a little outside of the box. And then question and answers at the end, Feel free to type them in the chat or Q&A or the Q&A box uh, and we can get to them at the end. So here's the presentation outline. Uh, we already covered introductions and disclaimers, but I want to touch briefly on consultation. It's kind of a recap of what we talked about on Friday, but mitigation measures are what come out of consultation. So that's why we'll recap on consultation. Then we'll go into mitigations, standard mitigations, and creative mitigations, um, then Q&A. So the consultation component is a recap uh, for those of you who have continued to watch. But as you know, like wherever you are as a local government representative or an agency or a firm, you're kind of on this side of the spectrum. Maybe it's a small project, maybe it's a massive project. Um, and then you may be working with one tribe or multiple tribes, um, but there's something that connects uh, no matter where you're at on the spectrum, and that's the relationship. This is something that you want to promote, cultivate, build, maintain, strengthen, encourage, and a lot of these series are intended to help you do that, to be aware of things to be um, considerate of and to pursue and maybe some things to be weary of and to watch out for. So this is all meant to improve the relationship between you and wherever your project is, your proposed action and the tribes. So the reason for developing mitigations um, coming from consultation, as you know, is to support tribal sovereignty. It, it protects tribal self-determination. It recognizes the tribal self-governance 
and it ensures legal responsibilities are met. So these are all reasons that consultation is so important, developing proper mitigations is so important. Um, and I'm sure you realize that, and this is no way a, a comprehensive exhaustive list. There's so many more reasons, and this is definitely not in order, but this is just to help you get the picture of why it's so important. And I know you know it's important and that's why you're watching. And so thank you for that. But again, a recap for the consultation process. Uh, if you recall, it starts with the initial meetings. Um, and then I broke it into like parts. There's a pre-consultation process where you figure out how is the consultation gonna go? Uh, how often are you gonna meet? Where are you gonna meet? Different things like that. Then it goes into what I would label part one, and that's where the proposed action is presented. So you give the information, uh, answer questions, go more in depth on exactly what is being proposed. Then there's part two where the tribe kind of discusses the impacts. So now they have a clear idea of what you're proposing to do. The tribe can then say, this may be an impact, uh, this may not, and different things like that. And the discussion continues to go from there. And then part three, project mitigations. That's where it comes out of those two meetings or groups of meetings and that discussion. So now that everyone is on the same page about what is being proposed and the potential impacts, then begins the difficult discussion of where do we go from here? And that's the mitigations. That's what we'll be diving in depth today. Again, the pre-consultation portion of the meetings are timing, finances, location, what format or process the meetings will be in. Is it formal? Is it in the field? Is it informal, like in between staff? Then it flows into part one, where the scope, maps, summary, timeline, all the details um, surrounding the proposed action is shared and discussed. Then part two, the impacts to sacred sites, historic properties, cultural resources, tribal cultural resources, trust assets. And this one's a big one, a contemporary practices. Uh, this one hasn't been really considered much in legislation. Uh, it's being considered more and more. But what are contemporary practices that the tribe does now that they view as important and to the their culture, their society, their tribe, their people, their customs? And will that proposed action impact that as well? And when I talk about impacts, I don't mean necessarily negative. I know that in CEQA, um, NEPA, different legislative actions focus more on the negative impacts. But in these meetings, you also may discuss the positive impacts. Does the proposed action uh, help or promote uh, these things that the tribe has interests or concerns in. And of course, if it impacts people under tribal jurisdiction, this will also be a topic for discussion in the consultation part two process. So it flows from pre-consultation part one, part two, then we get to part three, the mitigations, what we are discussing today. And there are examples, I'll dive more in depth but cultural monitors, inadvertent discovery, these are, you know, common terms that you as a planner may have come across, maybe even meet with or are in charge of overseeing in um, different facets. And then we'll get into creative mitigations towards the end. So the consultation process flows. I, I made this lovely diagram for you to see, but the agency and firm is kind of like the light green and the tribe is the dark green. And as the consultation flows, the there's a shift that happens. And oftentimes that 
doesn't really get recognized, which is why consultation processes get so confusing and the direction seems really weird. But as soon as you grasp how the local government is to present the concept and the description, and then their role diminishes in the consultation process. And once the tribe has the concept, the description, then their role increases in the consultation process as they discuss the impacts and together you determine the mitigation. And from there, uh, we'll dive more into depth into the mitigation measures, but the outcome should be to develop mitigation measures and to avoid significant impacts. But we all know that that's ideal, that should be the goal, but that's not always the case. Sometimes the discussion either gets so many rabbit trails and uh, a mitigation is not agreed upon, or the mitigation that is discussed and considered is not feasible, maybe due to time, maybe due to resources or other things, staffing. Um, there's so many different components that that flow into that. So ideally, a mitigation measure should come from that. And ideally, the consultation ends with no mutual agreement and therefore no mitigation. That's why it's vital that both parties involved continue to pursue and discuss mitigations. And that's why we're discussing what we're talking about today. And that's why we'll cover creative mitigations at the end. So hopefully it will get over that hurdle of black and white yes and no and get into more of that gray area about what if. How about we meet in the middle? What can we do to, to benefit um, the tribe's concerns um, and different things like that. And so consultation should lead to mitigation measures. So we covered the consultation components in different uh, sessions. We covered really in depth into, you know, section 106, AP 52, SB 18. We covered the protocol and policy last time. Um, so I won't cover that in depth. But one important thing that I always stress in every session is the importance of definition. If you remember, my example about um, the cross-cultural example about how someone could say one thing and it could mean different things. Uh, it's the same thing with mitigation measures. So when you discuss mitigations, uh, when you discuss even impacts, um, it's important to understand that you're on the same page with what you're talking about. And cultural places, there's definitions that are codified However, there are two new terms that are, are growing and it's hard to measure exactly the boundary of where they are and therefore it's hard to measure the impact and therefore it's hard to propose a mitigation. So these two terms that are, are increasing in use is cultural landscape. This is something that is um, that has been in existence but is growing more and more in the use of, of being used more. And so it's uh, cultural um, and natural resources that is kind of a, a landscape that associated with a historic event, activity, persons, and maybe even has cultural or aesthetic values to the tribe. So they can express that they have a cultural landscape and maybe your proposed action has potential impacts on that cultural landscape. And then that leads to discussion of mitigations. How do you mitigate the impacts on that cultural landscape? Equally that's being used is the ethnographic landscape. A landscape containing a variety of natural and cultural resources it's kind of similar to the cultural landscape, but it's more associated with heritage and people. 
so it's tied with a, a specific ethnographic um, purpose and reason. So these are some things to, to be aware of as you enter into consultation, as you enter into discussions of impacts, and especially as you enter into developing mitigations. So when you develop mitigations um, and impacts and consultation, you'll be corresponding with a lot of these entities. The main one is Native American Heritage Commission at the, the starting point. And then it flows more into the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. And you may interact with the State Historic Preservation Officer, um, either by requirement by state law, or that used to be the standard of practice prior to the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer. So the reason that there is both is the capacity building intent of the government. So what we see is a transition in numerous areas, and it applies to the preservation officer as well. But you have the, the federal government or state, and you have the tribe in, in capacity. And the goal is to build the capacity of the tribe. And so you'll be working essentially less with the state has the SHPO and working more with the TIPO. And this is the case in numerous facets, numerous components, uh, but it's starting to be experienced more and more in the cultural component of dealing with consultation and correspondence. So to be understanding that that transaction transition is happening um, and to be aware of that. You may also correspond a lot with the cultural director. Sometimes there's a department, sometimes there's a committee, sometimes the tribal council itself functions as that capacity. So understanding, you know, what which venue that you're working with and corresponding with. Cultural monitors, that's something we're beginning to see a lot of more and more. And I'll touch more on cultural monitors in a moment. But you may interact with Tribal Office of Self-Governance. Tribes are starting to establish more of their self-governing office and responsibilities in a special delegated office and positions uh, that specifically handle those, um, those interactions in that field. And again, you may work with the tribal council on some level, especially if it's a huge impact or, or a lot of mitigations, very in-depth mitigations, you may have interactions with the tribal council and government to government meetings, or maybe who you're working with needs to go back to the tribal council, discuss things, and then they get guidance, directions, or um, a decision from the tribal council, and then they come back to you. You, as a result, you may also work with the executive assistant. Some tribal councils have executive assistants who either assist their role in the council or assist the council in general. And so it's good to have them possibly CC'd on your correspondence or request um, if interacting with the tribal council. So now we can dive more in depth on mitigations. As you know, there's mitigations for all kinds of things. We'll be focusing more on CEQA, AB 52 on cultural resources, tribal cultural resources. Then there's of course NEPA and section 106 with trust assets. Those mitigations we're not going to talk too much about today because they're simply just alternatives and what we're discussing today can cross pollinate with those uh, discussions as well. Then with local governments and SB 18 with developing updating general plans specific plans, uh, the mitigations again is similar to NEPA in the sense of it's just pursuing alternatives. And a lot of what we discuss can help you uh, cross pollinate with that as well. So when 
dealing with cultural resources and tribal cultural resources, many of you are familiar with the CEQA state guidelines. There's the website which you can see these. Many of you have these hard copies. Many of you are really familiar with these and you read them at night and props to you. And, um, but there's a lot of guidance in here when it comes to developing mitigations. And so I just wanted to highlight some of those. And again, some of you are quite familiar with it, but there's no way to discuss mitigations without discussing the impacts, because how can you mitigate an impact if you don't know the extent or level of impact and therefore need to discuss the level and depth of mitigations? So number five is cultural resources, and you discuss historical resource, archaeological resource, and human remains. And that's why a lot of mitigation measures are tailored to these, because that's what's being measured. Um, and number, I think it's nine, this number on tribal cultural resources, discuss um, this. Many of you know that this is kind of the new component to it. Cultural resources was more archaeological in nature, more historic, if you will. And then tribal cultural resources is tailored more to be cultural and can't be measured in stereotypical archaeological standards. So this was added because they understood that the tribe is the expert in knowing what is important to them and the impacts to them. And so that's why this was added and is different than cultural resources. And again, we see how it includes sites, features, places, and there it is, landscape. The landscape, sacred place, um, that is valuable to the tribe, definitely needs to be considered and discussed. Whether it's listed or eligible for listing, um, that's the real catch here is the eligible if it's eligible to be listed um, in the California Register of Historic Resources. And then as it, if it's determined to be a resource by you as the lead agency, or maybe you're working for the lead agency, um, but with a caveat that it, the resource must be considered by the tribe. So in making the determination, and therefore determining the impact and the mitigations, it's so important to touch base with the tribe and their perspective on that. But again, most of you are familiar with all this. It's pretty common. But the mitigation measures must include alternative mitigation measures if the tribe requests consultation. So if you have already developed mitigation measures um, and then the consultation happens, then if the tribe requests that alternative mitigation measures be included, then those must be included. So that's really important to document that request in the consultation process, and then to have that reflected in your proposed mitigation measures. Mitigation measures may include um, the avoidance or lessening, this is something that we're familiar with as well. And it may include avoiding significant impacts to a tribal cultural resource. Or it may include appropriate measures for preservation. So either lessening the impact, avoiding uh, significant, or to preserve and mitigate. And this is actually kind of the flow that it should be. First, it should be considered to avoid uh, and lessen. Then it should be uh, avoiding significant impact. And then last is mitigation measures. Mitigation measures mean that the first two didn't work um, or you're trying to lessen the first two. So mitigation measure should not be a first um, pursuit in this. It it's really should be towards the end to mitigate. 
So these mitigation measures are outlined in CEQA. Again, you might be familiar with preservation in place. Again, the first option, protecting the integrity, protecting traditional use, protecting confidentiality resource. And again, our next session will dive more in depth on confidentiality. What does that mean? And how do we apply that? And what do we need to be aware of? And then permanent conservation easements with um, proper management. So these are pretty standard mitigation measures that are included in the CEQA guidelines, um, the handbook. And so we'll dive into standard mitigations. And this is really um, what I'm excited to talk about more. And then we'll get into creative mitigations. So standard mitigations is, of course, cultural investigations, cultural monitors, and inadvertent discovery. As you know, cultural investigations come in different levels. There's level one, level two, level three. And the most common is level one. And it's the surface level investigation. And there are reports that are developed. And not often is it led to level two. And then there's level three. So level one. Not very many people know that there's a difference between a cultural resource survey and an archaeological resource survey. They're actually two different things. Uh, sometimes the terms get used interchangeably. But the main difference is the cultural resource survey includes uh, the historic component. This is why it's used often, because it meets like CEQA's requirements. Archaeological resource surveys don't, don't sometimes, they fall short of meeting the requirements of especially the tribal cultural resource components. So be understanding that there is difference in resource surveys and to be sure that it meets uh, what you're looking for and the requirements that are needed. The larger archaeological mainly focuses on archaeological resources versus cultural is more of a, a broad approach, which is what's needed. Again, this is more surface level, record searching, field visits, uh, different things like that, meetings with the tribe. And this is often requested and implemented as a mitigation. But what often gets overlooked is when does the cultural investigation level one turn into a level two? Or what is a level two cultural investigation? Well, in cultural, a level two is when a archeological or cultural significant site is identified in level one survey. So then a level, it usually leads to level two, which then they revisit that and they do further investigations. And this typically includes subsurface investigations. I know some level one cultural investigations have subsurface investigations, but really level two is where the subsurface veggies, uh, investigations take place. And so it's more of a focus and in-depth investigation, typically around a identified site. So this sounds like it would be the end, but there's actually a level three. And level one sometimes can skip to level three, uh, bypassing level two. So know that level two isn't necessary to get to level three. Um, however, it is very rare that that happens. Typically it's one, then two, then three, but know that it can go from a level one immediately to level three investigation. So level three investigation says that the impact is significant and unavoidable. That's when a level three investigation needs to take place. And this is all about data recovery um, or adverse effects. effects. So when the impact is going to be significant and unavoidable, then level three is really about saving what is going to be destroyed. Um, this is what level three encompasses. It's a very intensive investigation with lots of controlled sampling, 
excavation, a lot of collections and different things like that. And so that know that if it does lead to a significant unavoidable, then it will probably lead to a level three cultural investigation. And then the mitigation plans widely varies. Not all mitigation plans can be applied straight across the board because tribal cultural resources are unique. Uh, tribes concerns differ and therefore there is no one size that fits all. So know that there's different levels to the cultural investigations and being aware of the level that may apply to your project and understand the price tag and the timeline and the manpower um, that's affiliated with all this. And so it's good to be aware of that. Cultural monitors. Cultural monitors may be assigned to your project. And this is if there is known cultural significance or potential. And we're seeing this more and more often. And sometimes multiple tribes will send their monitors. So there may be several cultural monitors on site. But know that they are not there to babysit. They actually have a purpose for being there. And they are actually commissioned by the tribe to serve in their official capacity. So they've gone through their vetting process on the tribal side. And there are numerous things that they have been educated in or aware of and that they have to adhere to. And I've included some of these. These include Resource Management Act, Local Government Act, Resource Places Act, Burial and Cremations Act, and the Coroners Act. So these are things that they should be diverse in, and this is the expertise that they're bringing, as well as uh, what has been expressed to them uh, from the tribe. So they operate in this official capacity. But cultural monitors may be requested for numerous reasons. One is if it's a justifiable recommendation due to the impact. So they have valid the tribe may have valid concerns and may uh, commission a cultural monitor to be on site. And when there is condition of consent uh, that there are known significant sites, if earthworks are within ground disturbance, ground disturbance is within 100 uh, yards or meters of an actual ar archeological site. So they there may not be a site on your project site, but maybe in the vicinity there is. And so the cultural monitor will be there to oversee that. And upon the recommendation of a qualified archaeologist, most of you get your this mitigation measure from the cultural investigation report. And that's good. It shows the archaeologic as a qualified archaeologist. I can't talk right now. So the archaeologist knows that this is a mitigation and will include it in his report to know that there may be an impact and a cultural monitor can lessen that impact or avoid other impacts that may happen. And as a recommendation from the tribe um, or part of their management plan, they may issue a cultural monitor. And know that during the course of the project, you know, things happen. Um, we all develop plans and we, we all know things don't always go according to plan. So cultural monitor may go be commissioned there to uh, monitor those uh, adverse effects. So then this leads to inadvertent discovery. This includes the cultural monitor who may be there and recognize it. Um, and then the lead agencies involved, the coroner's office, the qualified archaeologists, there we go, and the Native American Heritage Commission, the TIPO, and the landowner sometimes are all included in the discovery. And again, the archaeologists may include this in the cultural investigation. And there is a certain flow that happens when human remains are discovered. So we all know that work needs to cease, but 
it's important to understand what that boundary is because there's so many different numbers out there and some may abide by the minimum requirements and some may be increased. So being aware that what that boundary of where work needs to cease um, is. And then the contact the corner, if it's Native American in nature, which it might be considering, you know, the concern and the in cultural investigation and the cultural monitor. So if it's an American Indian descent, then the Native American Heritage Commission needs to be contacted within 24 hours. And once the Native American Heritage uh, Commission is contacted, they will determine who the most likely descendant is, and they will reach out to them. They will either identify family or maybe the tribe's clan or maybe the tribe itself in that process and uh, determining what that most likely descendant would like to do. Once the most likely descendant is identified, then they really get to determine what they want um, done with, with the human remains. And sometimes the landowner is involved. For an example, if the most likely descendant can't be identified, um, it may be up to the landowner to decide what they would like it to be done with the human remains. So understanding you know, all this in the mitigation of inadvertent discovery, and a lot of this is outlined in the CEQA guidelines. So now we get to creative mitigations. This is the portion where, you know, you've included the standard mitigations, but maybe in the consultations with the tribe, those aren't good enough. Maybe there needs to be something more um, included in the mitigations, or maybe in the consultations, they, the tribe said, we would like additional mitigations to be included. So these mitigations are starting to happen um, in different projects, and but they're not common. They're, they aren't really suggested in the first meeting, um, but these are things that you can maybe suggest in your consultation meetings and discussing mitigations. But co-management of resources is something that is growing more and more common with tribes. Um, they're starting to participate more in the management side of things. So maybe adding that component somehow in co-managing. And that shares responsibility, it shares resources, it shares costs. Um, co-management is getting more and more popular and more and more common. Something that's not as popular is funding a national register for those nominations. Maybe you get to a cultural uh, investigation level three or, or two, and you can fund you know, that process um, to have it included in the register, either state or federal. Um, and that's a lengthy process and it, it costs money. And funding that process is an actual mitigation. And so this could be a consideration um, as you discuss mitigations with the tribe. Maybe funding research, um, maybe even creating the research, um, funding the more historical ethnographic records with the tribe, um, or maybe, you know, in this process, you find that the, the records are incomplete and maybe refurbishing or bringing them all together uh, because they can be pretty sporadic um, as you're researching the different databases, maybe funding an effort to consolidate all of those and then updating um, each of those databases with that newly concentrated uh, findings. So that's a mitigation measure. Again, that doesn't get brought up often. Uh, and that responsibility often falls to the tribe. But as a mitigation measure, you can suggest, hey, we'll fund that effort um, to help alleviate that impact. And maybe building capacity, maybe 
sponsoring part of the tribe's cultural program in some component. I know a lot of tribes are starting to establish signage to show kind of their cultural ancestral heritage in that area. Cultural centers are starting to be popping up in different tribal lands, um, different things like that. And there are funds set aside for that purpose and maybe um, either building up capacity for the tribe to do that or funding one of those programs um, can be an actual mitigation. Then performing regional surveys. This is pretty common with trails, but yes, you do a survey for that site that you're working on, but a mitigation measure could be to fund an uh, investigation survey that is much broader. Maybe there are sites that the tribe hasn't investigated yet, or um, they have other areas of concerns, and maybe they have projects that they're developing, and kind of helping them get one step further along in that process is a mitigation. So helping the tribe see where they want to go and then coming alongside them in, in helping them achieve that. That is a mitigation measure. And then management plans, uh, helping them participate in a management plan or maybe even uh, proposing a management plan be developed. Um, is a mitigation measure. Uh, that's kind of a common thing, but acquiring cult cultural conservation e easements is something that's kind of not seen as much. Uh, say for an example, there's um, a certain trail or path that the tribe uses for its religious purposes or ceremonial, or maybe it's just cultural. Um, outside of those two realms. And maybe not only developing the projects, but maintaining that the tribe has an easement to continue to do that. Uh, that's a mitigation measure. So these are some creative mitigation measures to, to help you in your discussion with the tribe and developing mitigations, especially after impacts have been identified. Um, and it's okay to brainstorm. It's okay to take time to research mitigations. It's okay to ask the tribe what they would like to see happen. Um, but don't be discouraged if your project stalls in the mitigation discussions. And uh, don't let it stall in the sense that you can't come into agreement. I think there are so many different creative ideas on how to move forward together. And mitigations really are, are designed to be that way. So understanding the purpose is how do we move forward together? And I know it's a difficult conversation, but it's a conversation that needs to be had. And so that's why this list has been generated to help you in that discussion um, to develop mitigations. So again, I know you may be familiar with a lot of this. Um, so I thank you for listening. And I hope for those who aren't as familiar, I hope you learned something. And overall, I hope you're encouraged in the process of developing mitigations. And if you ever um, get to a place where it's difficult in developing mitigations, or you don't know where to start, or um, anything like that, I'll be more than happy to help you in any way that I can. So with that, I'll open it up to questions. Um, I don't know if there are any questions in the chat or people want to ask, but um, I'm available for questions. And since we're coming up on time, like seven more minutes, uh, feel free to shoot me an email or call um, if you're uncomfortable asking over this session. Thanks, Ethan. That was great. And again, those who are attending, there is a question and answer feature down below. Feel free to utilize that. I did have kind of one question comment. So again, if we think, you know, if you think about the definition of mitigation measures is fixing an environmental problem. And when we deal with what is, is a, a significant effect, we're talking about substantial adverse change to the physical environment. And with 
tribal cultural resources, what we might consider as a, a physical change to the environment would be somewhat different than a um, what, what that change might be for a tribal cultural resource. And so some of the creative mitigations you had mentioned, um, funding things, other things may not be what we would normally think in CEQA as mitigation, because it really doesn't reduce the impact to a physical, the physical environment, but for a tribal cultural resources, those are mitigation measures that would be important to the tribe. And so if you want to get through the, no, we're not going to have a significant impact to a tribal cultural resource, then those are things that certainly could be used. So, um, yeah, that's great. We did get one question in here. In the beginning of the consultation process, you mentioned financing. What does this refer to? Great question. Um, sometimes tribes will request that um, assistance in the meeting process. Maybe it's like gas money to come. Um, I know tribes sometimes fund that, sometimes they don't. Um, maybe it has more to do also with with tribes come to meetings, uh, a lot of times food is involved. And so it's like who figuring out kind of those logistics when it comes to meetings, when it comes to people, when it comes to time, there's money involved in many facets and venues and kind of discussing, okay, what, who's responsible for it? Because you don't want either side expecting, um, you don't want either side going in not on the same page when it comes to money, when it comes to footing the bill or providing something. Um, so that's what I mean by finances. There is some financial component to all that and having that in the discussion is important. So that would certainly encourage more participation. And again, the tribes being, um, they, being dependent on grant funding and such, they don't have a program to send someone 50 miles away to go visit a site or spend the time to do things. Yes. And I know like with, it's often the case with numerous entities like board meetings or something, if they aren't paid for their capacity, but they're given a stipend for their time and trouble. <laughs> and so that's often the case um, in consultations as well. When trying to get a response in consultation, is it good to just offer that or do you wait for the tribe to maybe bring that up as a, we'd like to respond, but our hands are tied. Um, I think it really depends on the local government or agency or firm on what their priorities are, what their values are. And if they have a capacity to offer it, then, and, and that is in line with what they have, then that's good. If it, they have it in their capacity to, to meet a request that has been asked of that, then that's equally as good. But if neither of those are the case, then that should be discussed and laid out before the actual consultation begins so that everyone is understanding that they're on the same page. Great. Um, while other questions might be coming in, I did in the chat box put our next topic on for November 9th, which is discussing effective construction mitigation measures. So with yours truly. So anyway, um, not seeing any more questions, Ethan, this was great. Uh, this really builds on the previous um, things that you have mentioned and we look forward to the next session. Yes, and the next one will be confidentiality. And now that you know we've come this far and we've developed mitigations and different things like that, then we come to publications and record keeping and understanding you know how does confidentiality fit in all that. That's exciting. Okay, well, thank you for Thank you, Ethan, for presenting, and thank you for all our attendees coming to our brown bag lunch. And stay tuned for more exciting adventures ahead. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.